Hi boys and girls, Mrs. Blackburn here, and I'm here to read Seeker of Knowledge, The Man Who Deciphered Egyptian Hieroglyphs. This is a Fountas and Pinnell Heidemann book. And um, so I'd like you to imagine that all the books in the world that had English in them, all of them, were all of a sudden gone. No more books that had English in them at all. And so no one knew how to speak English. No one knew how to decipher it. Everyone else spoke a different language. They didn't know how to read it. They didn't know what the symbols meant, nothing. So that's what happened with hieroglyphs, the Egyptian language. And so that was used in ancient Egypt, not what they currently use. So no one could understand or unlock a lot of the ancient Egypt things that they used and understand the history there. So this is about a man who actually unlocked the hieroglyphic code. Along the Nile River, the ibis bird uses its long curved bill to search for food. In ancient Egypt, the ibis was sacred to the god Thoth who also had a long curved bill, but instead of searching for food, Thoth searched for knowledge. According to legend, Thoth gave the ancient Egyptians pictures to use for writing. With the gift of writing, the Egyptians became e seekers of knowledge too. For 3,000 years, the Egyptians wrote about their world, covering their temples with words, filling their libraries with books. Then invaders came and destroyed Egypt, and the pictures called hieroglyphs were forgotten. In 1790, a French boy named jean Francois Campalion was born. When he was seven, his older brother told him about General Napoleon, the great leader of France, who was in Egypt uncovering the past. Someday I'll go to Egypt too, jean Francois told his brother as he sat spellbound, imagining himself with Napoleon making his own discoveries. When Jean Francois was 11, he went to school in the city of Grenoble. There, his brother took him to meet a famous scientist who had been in Egypt with Napoleon. The scientist's house was filled with Egyptian treasures. Each one captured the boy's imagination. Can anyone read their writing? asked Jean Francois. No, no one, the scientist replied. Then I will one day, says Jean Francois, and he left the house full of enthusiasm sure that he would be the first to discover the key to the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Back home, his brother helped get him down all the books they had on Egypt. On moonlit nights, Jean Francois stayed up reading long after he should have been asleep. His brother nicknamed him the Egyptian and brought him, bought him new notebooks. Jean Francois filled them with hieroglyphs. There were prowling lions, angry monkeys, trumpeting elephants, and sharp-eyed ibis birds with their long curved bills. He could not read the Egyptian words, but he dreamed that one day he would as he sailed up the Nile. When Jean Francois finished school at 16, his brother took him to Paris to meet the scholars who were studying a black stone from Rosetta, Egypt. The stone was covered with Egyptian and Greek words and told of a king of Egypt named Ptolemy. By reading the Greek, the scholars hoped to decipher the Egyptian. But the work was difficult, certainly too difficult for a boy, and the scholars turned Jean Francois away. They did not see the fire burning bright in his eyes. They did not recognize the gen genius who had already learned all the, all the known ancient languages. They did not know what he was seeker of knowledge, one who would not rest until he had found. So the author calls him a genius here. Would you agree? Would you agree that he's a genius?
Jean Francois gathered his notebooks and returned to Grenoble. There he taught school. His students often came to hear him talk about Egypt, her pharaohs and gods, and the mysterious writing. Once, even Napoleon came to Grenoble and sat up all night listening spellbound as Jean Francois told the great man of his dreams. Napoleon promised to send Jean Francois to Egypt when he conquered the world. Napoleon dreamed of glory. Jean Francois dreamed of discovery. But a few months later, Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. France was now defenseless. Her enemies poured in. They surrounded Grenoble and in the early morning bombarded the city. Jean von Francois ran to save his notebook from the flames. The people were angry with Napoleon and anyone who knew him. They pointed fingers at Jean Francois and called him a traitor. He fled into the woods, leaving his notebooks behind. There he lived like a hunted dog. It was weeks before it was safe to come out and months before he saw his notebooks again. During these troubled times, scholars everywhere were racing to solve the mystery of Egyptian writing. Unbelievably, things were said. Ridiculous books were written. No one had the answer. Then an Englishman discovered that a few of the hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone were letters, and he deciphered King Polydemy's name. Everyone said that the Englishman would be the first to unlock the door to Egypt's past. Everyone except Jean Francois. When Jean Francois was 30, he gathered up his notebook and left Grenoble. He made his way back to Paris to his brother. In Paris, Jean Francois studied the Rosetta Stone and their inscriptions. He compared the Greek letters with the Egyptian hieroglyphs and herded them, herded together his own alphabet of eagles and lions and dark-eyed chicks. But this wonderful list of letters was no help in reading the language. There were too many pictures he did not understand. What to make of a fish with legs, a jackal with wings, an ibis god with a long curved bill. There had been a link between the pictures and the Egyptian letters. But what was it? Jean Francois slept little. He ate almost nothing. Then on September morning in 1822, Jean Francois found a small package on his doorstep from a friend in Egypt. If it in it were the names of pharaohs copied from a temple wall. Each name was a jigsaw puzzle of letters and pictures. Jean Francois studied the names and saw the link. The pictures were sounds, too. Not single letters, but syllables, even whole words. One of the names drew him. It began with the hieroglyph of an old silent friend perched on a sacred staff. This was a picture of the god of writing, Thoth, followed by the letters M and S. Thothmes, Jean Francois suddenly exclaimed in the rushing sound of the pharaoh's name as if it carried on wings across the centuries filled the moon. The royal cartouche of Ring of Hope encircling Thothmes' name. Jean Francois raced down the street to his brother's office. He burst through the door, exclaiming, I have the key. Then he collapsed. He had not eaten. He had not slept. For five days, he lay near death. On the fifth day, he awoke. Pen and paper, he whispered, and he wrote of his discovery to the world. People all over France celebrated his triumph as Jean Francois became the first to translate the ancient writing and open the door to Egypt's past. A few years later, the people of France sent Jean Francois to Egypt on an expedition to uncover more secrets. He knew Egypt so well in his mind that he was going home. 
As Jean Francois had imagined a thousand times in his dreams, he sailed up the Nile. Is this what you thought would happen or expected? And what do you think it means to open the door to Egypt's past? Do you think that they had a lot of discoveries since he unlocked the key to the language? Once ashore, he entered the ruins of a temple. A magnificent flock of ibis suddenly rose up from the reeds and took flight. Below the ibis saw the seeker of knowledge touch the stone walls. His fingers dipped into the carved pictures. He pressed his ear to the stone and listened to the ancient voices. Have you learned anything from this biography? How does this ending make you feel? And how do you think the author of this book felt about Jean Francois? And what may have compelled him to write the story? I hope you enjoyed this book. I've always found Egyptian hieroglyphs fascinating myself. Maybe you would like to learn more about them. Until next time, bye-bye.